Hello, everyone. Hey. Um, welcome, and thank you for coming to the 39th annual Green Thumb Grow Together Conference. And welcome to all of you joining us virtually. My name is Anthony Reiter. I'm the Assistant Director for Planning and Programs at Green Thumb, where I oversee our special events, educational programming, garden visioning program, and more. I have the distinct honor of introducing our moderator for this morning's panel, Learning from the Land, Bounties of Wisdom from Black and Indigenous Growers. Maya Marie S. is a Black urban farmer and foodways educator with deep roots, a frequent and beloved partner of ours. She's invested in creating accessible spaces for Black and Brown people to learn about food and health that center their personal stories and food traditions. Her interests in food have led her to earn a culinary arts degree, to apprentice at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems at UC Santa Cruz, where she studied ecological and sustainable horticulture, and to study community health at Hunter College. Let's give a warm welcome to Maya and the rest of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and welcome everybody. Um, good morning. Thanks for coming out on a kind of like little humid Saturday morning. Um, so I'm really excited for this panel of amazing growers and land stewards. Um, and I'm excited to get into these questions. Just a little, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are going to have time for like audience questions, so there will be some index cards going around. Um, I think from Anthony or volunteers, and we'll answer a couple of those towards the end of the panel. Um, and yeah, so. The intention with this panel is really getting to connect with growers and land stewards, particularly those um, who are black and indigenous um, and some of the practices that they, and beliefs that they have with their, with their growing um, and whether it's from like seed saving, maintaining diverse and resilient crops. Um, a lot of those practices are coming from black and indigenous folks. So we're going to hear from some people who are doing that in the city um, and in community. So I'm going to do a couple of little introductions to some of our panelists. Um, so I'll do from, from, from start from this. End. <laughs> so today I'm excited to welcome Heather Warren Dombrova, who is a Jamaican American New Yorker raised in both Montreal, Quebec and the Bronx. She's a professional organizer and implementation coach who focuses on intentional productivity, helping clients tackle their mental clutter by supporting them to not only accomplish their goals, but to slay them. Um, she is a confirmed seed hoarder and if it sprouts purple, she'll make room to plant it. An avid gardener, Heather has been a member of Bissell Gardens and Urban Farm since its inception and serves on its board and helps to bring to life its founder's vision of local farmer's market. She has consulted for Just Food, coordinates her garden's participation and the Bronx Hot Sauce Project, sits on the board of the Northeast Bronx, let me get this last part. <laughs> I'm trying to give the full bio. Um, on the Bronx Northeast Bronx um, board, community garden. Um, Heather is also a foodie, a crafter, a tech geek, and she's combined these interests into Urban Cultivated, a small but interactive group designed to connect folks with creative collaborations and resources already existing in their community. Um, and she's the proud foster fail mama to a rambunctious rescue dog named Dakota. So please welcome Heather. Our next panelist is Alex Gassinus. Oh, and Heather uses she, her pronouns. Um, I also use she, her pronouns. So whenever you're writing your questions, you can address everyone well. Um, Alex Cassidis, they, them, is a land steward, artist, and animal lover, born and raised in the Muncie, Lenape, and Canarsie territories, also known as East New York, Brooklyn, with ancestral roots in Honduras. 
Alex's journey in reconnecting to the land and beings across the ecosystem has led them to working at the Hattie Carthen Community Garden and Market, graduating from Farm School NYC's Citywide Certificate Program, and becoming an alum of Rocksteady Farms Queer Farmer Centered Pollinate Training Program. Their path continues as they steward the land at East New York Farms UCC Youth Farm site, where they're currently the farm manager. Some of Alex's other passions include rescuing animals, creating music, painting, and learning about plant medicine. Um, oh, Alex continues their journey of land stewardship by investing their time building with queer farmers through the National Young Farmers Culti Vemos cohort, which is addressing farmer mental health and self-care. Alex is also an active seed steward, participating in seed saving with comrades from Reclaim Seed. Let's welcome Alex. And our last but not least panelist, Kofi Thomas, the son of Caribbean parents from Dominica. Kofi Thomas is a community builder and avid gardener. His mission is to reconnect people with their environment and the community around them. He is a member of several community gardens. His motto is, we grow together. He is currently the director of the People's Garden, founder and director of the Good Life Garden, and serves as a chairman of the Neighborhood Advisory Board for Bushwick. Everyone, please welcome Kofi. Um, cool. So we're going to get right into our questions. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's going to be like a conversation. I'm really excited to share space with you all. I think there's also pictures happening behind us at you know, a certain point. Um, cool. So before getting into like kind of the principles and the practices that you all have in your growing spaces, I think it would be really cool to hear from each of you how you got started as a farmer or gardener and why this work is meaningful to you. And anyone can start. You want to start? <laughs> I'll be polite. I will start. Okay. All right. This is my, this is the panel. They're all amazing people. Uh, my name is Kofi. Uh, how I got started as a gardener, uh, farmer. Uh, I suppose it started when I was really, really young, just through uh, observation. Like my family is from Dominica. And so as a kid, uh, I thought it was natural to always have fresh herbs in the house. All of my aunts would always come by and they would trade seeds with each other every year. And they would trade like flower buds. And whenever anybody got sick, you would get uh, like a surgical team of aunties around you to be like, you need to drink this tea right now and put this on your foot. And so <laughs> from the time I was really young, uh, I think... I started to become a gardener and have a relationship with the land. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Kofi. Hi, y'all. I'm Alex. Um, so how I started farming and gardening, I think at four years old, I was also pretty young. Um, I had a caretaker who had a garden in her backyard. And I remember at the time touching soil with my tiny hands at that time, um, playing with worms and harvesting tomatoes and different veggies. And just like, as a four-year-old asking like so many questions about like all the things about farming and gardening and just trying to like put things together at such a young age. And I think you said, why we do this work? Yeah, um, it's meaningful to you. It's meaningful to me because for me personally, it has allowed me to create my own uh, spirituality. Um, every time I work on the land, I get closer to my ancestors and my spirit guides. Um, it feels like in another lifetime, I've done this work before. So it's just like in this lifetime now, my journey is to protect the earth and be a land steward who is at service to the land, um, not only take from the land, but also give back. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather, dropping things already. <laughs> I told Kofi I yeah. needed to be near a table because I drop things. Um, so I think my connection as well started very young. Um, 
I was born in New York, but then uh, went back to Jamaica with my grandmother when I was like, before I was talking. And at her house, um, there was this huge mango tree in the front, right? And, um, and there was always a story everyone had a type of fruit tree. My mom used to always say, I don't understand white American kids, why did they cry, find trees here? Like, what do you mean? Like, There's no fruit, what's the purpose? Um, and that was always the thing, like, you know, it, in the West Indies, you, you give directions by like the tamarind tree and things like that. So I think it's always rooted in food. Um, and, and I remember in her, back, in her backyard, it wasn't to play, it was to grow. And there was plantain, there was like sour cherry. So she would take me and like show me all the things. We'd go to the garden before breakfast to pick the plantain or the banana. To, and then I sat with her to cook it. So there was always that connection with what we ate, where we got the food and then cooked it fresh. Um, and then here, I think it was also, you know, I lived in, lived in a, an apartment and then we, we moved, we moved north <laughs> and then went, li, uh, li, moved to a house. And the first thing that um, my mom's oldest brother did, he came down from Poughkeepsie and he planted corn. <laughs> and to this day, I remember my, my neighbor was like, how's your uncle, the one who planted all that corn? Um, Cause it was just this field of corn. I mean, a field in our little, you know, little square, but it was so unusual at the time. Everyone was doing tomatoes and peppers. And he was like, no, we're going big. Um, <laughs> and, and that has just carried on. Um, my mom moved back and again, it was, okay, I need an avocado tree. So there's always that connection to what there is and that importance of how we pick and, and prepare and the community that that flows around that. Thank you, so beautiful. Um, I also really like that all of you kind of like share like things starting from your, your childhood um, and like how that kind of influenced your interest in, in land stewardship. Um, and I'm curious thinking about your childhood, how either those memories or any other parts of your culture or ancestral heritage um, how that like informs your understanding of your work um, as well as like your community around you now. And I can repeat that question if it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but like how does that inform the work that you do and, and your, your growing practices? Um, I could go. Um, I think like I had mentioned before, um, like doing the farming brings me back to my childhood. So I'm getting all these like memories that I didn't remember like growing up as an adult. But when I do the work, I remember something from my childhood immediately. So also like seeing farming as very therapeutic and like healing, like healing with the plants and the land. Um, so I see that for like my community and my community work and like trying to engage people around um, plants as healers and um, plant medicine and just like inviting community into our spaces to like grow things as medicine. So I think like working with the land is medicine for my soul and also for like everybody else. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll mix it up. Um, so I don't wanna cheat. <laughs> Um, I think when I, when I heard this question, what the connection that it has for me and how I go about, especially community gardening, um, is again, I think going back to Jamaica, the, the motto for Jamaica is out of many, one people. And I, I honestly think that's how I go about gardening and community gardening, whether it's choosing what I grow, I'm always looking for the story behind the seeds and um, if it's from somewhere else and there's a story, like I wanna try that as well. Um, I also, you know, talk to neighbors and, and others where we start to share stories, right? So like Alex is talking about the community, I think that that definitely brings in, even if the person, especially probably if the person is not necessarily my culture, um, but the foods are different, sorry, the foods are the same. Um, and then that story, there's that connection across food, 
Um, and then the stories get shared, the recipes get shared. Um, that's something that I've learned even at the farmer's market that we've started. Um, something like eggplant has multiple names, right? It's aubergine. In different countries, you have the different names. And that's something where you can start creating a story or sharing stories about how your family cooks it. Um, because there's always different ways that, that, people, that people can learn from each other. So I think that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I love that point about having that conversation. I think that's, that's what stands out for me when I think to like some of the farmers I've met in Dominica and some of the best farmers I've met, uh, even here in New York, uh, they talk all the time. <laughs> like uh, we know about everybody and what everybody's doing and how everybody's growing. And I think when we have those conversations, you get to discuss uh, anything that is wrong with any plant. Like all the time we'll say like, oh, what are you all doing to deal with aphids or white flies? And so we have this communal knowledge that is constantly growing. And something that has stood out for me was when I was younger, uh, understanding early that my mother learned from her grandmother who learned from her mother. And so our ancestral knowledge is almost this, uh, like, I almost feel like I'm able to talk to my ancestors through my mom and through elders. And I'm very fortunate that across the street from one of our gardens is an elder home. And so what we do is we really make an intentional effort to provide programming to bring seniors in because once they're in the garden, they are the biggest resource of knowledge that we have. And when we're talking to, like one of my favorite farmers uh, is Mr. Kwong, who's from China. And all we do is communicate through hand signals about what he wants to grow and how he wants to plant. But when he's planting, it teaches everybody around him so much because when he's planting, we're able to see like companion planting and have to plan out uh, crops for the season. And on top of that, he plants uh, something that we call bitter, bitter melon, but he plants it from China. And then my neighbors who are from Trinidad plant it and they call it like Kariley or Cersei. And then, sort of my, and then sort of my neighbors from Guyana. And then, so now we're able to all sit like side by side in plots planting and understand oh, like we're all eating this same vegetable. So what does this vegetable say about us? And what does it say about our ancestors that they decided to take this seed and bring it with them to this country and plant it here? And so we're able to make a lot of these connections through these conversations, even when it's nonverbal, but like I said, in the garden, when you have those conversations, you're able to, to grow together. And that's something that I've been... Uh, I guess using my daily practice is like, how do we have more programming that gets us into the same space where we are talking to each other and all working together so that uh, we can all become just healthier and better farmers and a better community. Thank you. Man, I love all those answers. You want to ask? <laughs> yeah, um, what you just said about like sharing like different vegetables from different um, cultures, how that one vegetable brings everybody from different places all together. Reminds me of like um, indigenous practices like seed saving, like saving the seeds for future generations and like how that brings people who are not even here yet together. It's like a full cycle of like, yeah, just reciprocos the reciprocity and gratitude of like seed saving and just like sharing those stories and like the culture like we're all different, but we're all the same. Thanks, y'all. Um, I think y'all also kind of touched a little bit on this next question in like different ways. Um, so maybe you can like elaborate it a little more. Um, like I think you've spoken about it with like the farmer's market or connecting with like the elder's home or even the seed saving. Um, but kind of thinking, reflecting back on, on the work that y'all do's impact on your on yourself, um, and also in connection to your your cultural heritage. Like, what are some ways that community land stewardship or your work has like changed you in your understanding, um, like through over time and like now, um, like how has that 
changed you or, or shifted your perspectives in working with community or with certain community members? Um, yeah, like how is how has this work changed you? I can start. <laughs> All right, so I used to be a very mean person. No, I'm <laughs> uh, But no, when I first started, I had, uh, I think, a lot of ideas and visions that were my own that I thought, like, this is how I'm going to come in. And I know these things about growing, so I'm going to be able to teach people. And that was not the case uh, at all. I was humbled very quickly um, <laughs> by, uh, by my elders. And it taught me how to enter spaces, how to, how to be a, a guest that really comes to help and not to come in as with any entitlement or as a savior, how to come in and listen first and find out who, who is there, who's in that community. What changed for me too was uh, a lot of narrative around our communities is what we lack uh, and that we need aid from different people or organizations. And there's not a lot of emphasis on the fact that our community is full of amazing people with resources that have not been tapped into. And so we're full of assets. And if we were to look more towards each other for how we can build and how we can take care of our communities, uh, it would put more power and more autonomy and more resilience back into ourselves, which is where it belongs. Uh, so it's changed working with the garden, working with my community on a daily basis uh, has changed the way that I see myself, has changed the way that I see the people around me. Uh, and I, it's definitely changed my my patience. Uh, it definitely, if you're going to, be a steward of any space in the community. Uh, patience, please have some patience. You have to, I feel like you almost have to understand a little bit about a lot of people because you're gonna get people from every walk of life, from every, every background, every age. And a lot of people are coming in there and you have to have some some compassion, some understanding for any trauma that they might be coming from. Uh, so on a personal note, it took me a while, and I'm still learning that when you have a garden that you open up in a neighborhood, Black people aren't always going to just immediately feel welcome into that space because there's not a history of black, pe black people being welcomed into public spaces anywhere in the country. So, and anybody who's a black gardener can tell you like black folks who you see might walk by your garden day in, day out, and they might give you like a head nod, like, hey, what up, bro, you good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I would be better if you came in and planted something. But it takes more to make us comfortable and welcome. And so once, once you start, so, so being in that space, it's made me be better as a person in thinking about what people walking by the garden are going through and where they're coming from. Thank you, that's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm so sweet, I, I'm laughing because every time I look down at my notes, I'm like, that's people like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I think one thing that I learned is that knowledge can come from anywhere. Um, you know, I think sometimes you we, we step into the garden and you have this idea of or this plan. Um, and I'm a planner. <laughs> um, so you have this plan of, of what you're going to do and when and, and how it's all structured. And then nature takes over and the plan goes out the window. Um, and so even if you, if you say, well, we can learn from the year before and we'll make a better plan, nature steps in and, it, and that goes out the window. Um, but when I say knowledge comes from everywhere, like there's, there's, there's all, again, you were mentioning people who, who walk by. I find that when you do stop and have that conversation, oftentimes, you know, you might initially kind of 
pin this person as like, hey, oh, someone who's in the community, they're doing their own thing, they're just walking by, they, they don't have time. Um, and then when you do stop and have conversations, you know, you'll get these initial shares. Well, you know, if you do this, that helps that. And if you add this, in my country, we add this or we do it this way. And if you actually stop to listen, right? Because sometimes I know I have some gardeners who are just like, I, I know what I'm doing. Um, but I think it's so much richer when, you know, when we stop and listen to the suggestions, right? And sometimes, I mean, I, I still plan, <laughs> but there are, there are areas of our garden where we're just kind of like, we have one gardener who she just throws seeds. <laughs> and 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 we're like no we've got to plant it in a line and then we're going to thin it because the packet said so um, and she's like nope i'm just going to throw the seeds and then what we used to do is we're like okay she's going to throw the seeds so we don't have to feed that we'll just thin hers and plant over in our area right so we've just learned how to connect and collaborate um and 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 we took her way of doing things and melded it with ours, right? And so created a new system. And I think that's what I've learned. Like the, you can always create something new. You can chat with each other and come up with something you didn't even think. Um, at, our, at our farmer's market area, there's a guy who during the week or during the off season, he has a mechanic shop across the street. And so he always has his cars and he works on like old BMWs and, 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 and Mercedes. And so he's always across and, I'm always like, oh, oh, and like one day we were talking and he saw me picking up garbage and he came to help. I never thought he would. I never asked. And he came to help me. And then all of a sudden we're talking and he is like talking about aquaponics and he used to do this and he's got tanks and he'd love to do it in the children's garden. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so, you know, now all of a sudden, because just because I was able to take a moment because I was annoyed, um, but I was still like, well, be respectful. He's here. He took the moment to actually come across and help. We had this conversation and all of a sudden there's something else that he can share with the garden and also, and then contribute to the community in the children's garden. So, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So beautiful. I love that. <laughs> that is, I, uh... I feel the same way like Kofi and Heather. Um, there's always something new to learn when you're doing this work. You can learn from the plants and just like observing. And also I enjoy what I've learned is like listening to community because they have so many lessons to give us. And also just like what I've learned doing this work is just like gratitude and being open to hearing people and what they have to say because there's different ways of doing this work and there's different areas in the farming world where people can um teach each other and like just like sharing the stories of people that pass by on the farm and you know them coming into the space is always a great thing because they get to enjoy the therapeutic benefits of plants and all the pollinators and everything and just like you can ask questions about anything and just leads you into like a story from the past, a story of people wanting to do things. And I think also learning about like, just having education for people when they do come onto the land, because people are looking for a space where they want community and they want to belong in that space. So just being open, having open arms and meeting people where they are, everybody has knowledge. Um, there's no hierarchy when you are tending to the land, like everybody is working together, just like all the plants are, all the pollinators are. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. I love hearing these stories too. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning a lot just from hearing y'all's responses. So those are really beautiful. So thank you. Um, my next question um, is, so, I know you all are sharing like how the land has changed you and maybe some of the perspectives you had coming into this work. Um, what's something that you think or feel is misunderstood about community growing spaces sometimes, particularly by those who aren't involved with stewarding it um, on a regular basis and maybe like, what are some of the challenges or lessons you've learned or, or seen from that? I can go. I think there's like a misunderstanding about how things grow or like the work that we put into the land. I think people, there's some people who don't have the knowledge. 
So they're just like assuming things are just growing like quickly and that nobody's like actually like putting in the work. Um, and also just like, um, like when people come onto the farms, cause we got a lot of volunteers at East New York Farms and um, there's always like this expectation that somebody has to do something or like you have to work. But I try to tell people like, you can just come into the space and like enjoy the space. There's no, there's no like, how do I put this? There's no expectation for you to like work. You can also enjoy the space. So I think people, think like coming into a farm or garden like you have to give yourself right away you can just give your time and your being and your energy and your presence to the farms um, I can piggyback on that um I think for me uh I think what's misunderstood is that any amount of time is valuable so I think a lot of people who maybe aren't aren't involved in community gardens will will assume that it's all or nothing. Either you are, are fully involved and you're always there every week and you're doing all the things or there's no space for you. Um, and I have to say, like, whether someone comes once for four hours or once a month for an hour or, you know, or just regularly, all of it is valuable. So, you know, if four people come out and can only spend an hour, that's, you know, multiple, that's four hours that we got made a really big dent in what needed to be done and so that and that builds upon itself going forward so I always like to tell people like oh I don't have the time and I'm like yeah you know if you if you need to come out very early in the morning on a Saturday um at like seven and then just an hour and that you know that's we'll meet you um because we like to do that too <laughs> you know we, we understand wanting to have your day and um so it's just sharing that. And I think also that not everyone, and, and this is even something I think of that's misunderstood sometimes by our members, right? That not everyone who's important, everyone's important and valuable, but not it doesn't mean that if you're part of a community gardener, that you're a gardener. Um, sometimes, especially um, if it's social media, you know, a lot of times by the time you come out back from the garden, you've taken pictures you don't have the energy to do that account that you set up that's still empty that I have. <laughs> um, and, and so someone who then is like, oh, wow, like I do that all the time and takes that on is, is a relief. It allows us to, to, again, reach more people. Some people, their skill is outreach to the community. And again, that's where what they're doing. Um, some of the gardens, like our work, we're a nonprofit. So having people that have the time to be on the board or having people be able to wait, you know, open the gate for green thumb. Like there's all these little things that people can do that I don't think initially come to mind. They think, oh, well, I'm only there to, to dig, plant and, and, and water and harvest where there's, there's so much more um, where people can, can, can use their skill set and be really valuable. Thank you. So what was the second part of that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is something you feel is misunderstood about community growing spaces by those who aren't involved in stewarding it on a regular basis? And if that creates any challenges. That was the second part? Yeah. Or what was the first part then? <laughs> that was the second part. The second part is if it creates any challenges for you. Okay. You know, you can just do the first part. Okay. So I knew there was two parts. I was trying to keep up. <laughs> okay. I was not great. I was not great in school. Okay. Um... <laughs> So things that people misunderstand about community gardens, I would agree, and I think most gardeners would agree, the amount of work that goes into it, uh, the amount of jobs you need to do now that you didn't plan on doing, uh, like you, we build most of our things, so I had to learn how to do some like carpentry. Uh, we didn't have a water system for the first year, so I had to figure out how to do plumbing uh, for the garden. Uh, and then there is, so many other services you take on, uh, depending on where you are. Like for ours, we also take on public safety. We used to have a block that was nicknamed the graveyard uh, in Bushwick. And so we, through conversation with our neighbors, learned that a lot of our women on the street had been 
uh, either threatened uh, or just felt unsafe. So we installed like a lighting system and had more activity out there. And so now the street is thankfully like safe to walk down and people can now walk their families down that corner. So there's public safety uh, involved. There's also a lack of arts programming in our neighborhood that's accessible to families. So we started throwing art festivals and music festivals. So I'm also a curator of uh, art. Uh, there's also, we also have a very, uh, our demographic, we have a lot of immigrants and a lot of them are being, or it's New York, so they're targeted by predatory landlords. So we connected them with housing rights lawyers and started some tenants rights organizations. So we're also a community uh, social power organization. And so there is, so the amount of jobs that are that grow out of being a community gardener are endless because it's the community so it's like whatever they need you will adapt to and try to serve and within where we live we are one of the only open spaces for blocks so when any when people need to meet to just be with each other they come they come to they come to us when people need to meet to talk about what's wrong and to organize and mobilize they come to us so that is something people on the outside may not know is how many different services our community garden provides and how many different jobs we end up having to do. Um, for the, what was the other part? Challenges? Again, <laughs> I was not creating any challenges, like all of having to do all of that kind of community organizing events. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It does uh, create challenges because when dealing with just where we are uh, in, in New York and us being in Brooklyn, a lot of the work starts to get into how do we, uh, how do we change the mindset of our people? And that comes from a lot of conversations. We have health and wellness festivals and workshops. And so a lot of our work is trying to find the people in our community who can be leaders, who can be teachers, who can be educators that can then come into the garden and lead workshops and teach their neighbors how to be healthy and how to take care of their mental health. And for me, a lot of the, I say, uh, a lot of the joy I get is when neighbors teach other neighbors that they can fight for each other. So when they get together and fight for each other's rights to housing, fight for each other's rights to health care, like that's, the part that I want to say, not that it's a challenge. The challenge part is getting people together because as you know, if you live in New York, you walk out your house, people do not say hello. People do not look at you. So trying to break through all the layers that we've built up just to stay safe, that is the challenge. But once we can get through those layers and get people inside the garden space talking to each other, then the then there is a like a plethora of opportunities and benefits that come out of that. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing those. And also like pointing to like all of the different hats that you're wearing, um, as well as the the need to be connected to the community in order to do the work as well. Um, so I also really I hear that as well. Thinking about those challenges as well as like the the things that you pointed out that can be a little misunderstood whether it's like welcoming pe people feeling welcome people feeling like oh let me like say hi and not just make a beeline even though I see this space growing in the middle of this busy area or um, whatever is like happening in the, the community space um, so what is like something that you hope to see happen um, for community growing spaces um, in the near future so maybe it doesn't maybe like remedy those things. Maybe it's not a remedy. Maybe it's just like a vision that you have for community growing spaces um, or even just for yourself as a grower and as a land steward. Um, so I think I'll, I'll piggyback on that, just that, that idea of involvement. Um, and from Bissell's perspective, we're actually a road that has never been paved. So we're very, it's, we're not that wide, but we're very long. Um, and 
because of where it is, and we're also, we, we border the number two, um, what is it, the train yard of the number two train. And we also are at the dead end streets. We're at the dead end of, you know, a few blocks of streets. So a lot of people, even though we've been around since the 90s, a lot of people don't know we're there. Um, and so the involvement is twofold. Um, the, the farmer's market area is the most visible. And a lot of times people think it's parks. So they're like, you know, they come and complain and they're like, they're calling 311 and then I get the call. <laughs> and, um, you know, I always start by, by backtracking and saying, hey, you know, we're your neighbors that are taking care of this. This is, it's not actually parks, it's DOT and um, it's your neighbors that are taking care of it. So come out, right? So there's that aspect of being welcoming and, and, and getting people to get involved um, despite whatever logistics you have for your particular garden. Cause every garden has like different things, whether it's location or just, um, or, you know, stance. Um, but, but the other thing I think also where it comes to involvement and welcoming is actually also our gardeners, right? So we're, I would say for Eden Thistle and a lot of gardens have this problem at some point is that we're an aging garden. And so that's, and we're an aging garden and COVID, you know, had its impact. Um, and so just that idea of, it almost feels like sometimes that we're starting over um, and retraining and almost starting out as if we're a new garden. Like we have to think of it that way. And like, how can we do things differently and learn from our mistakes in, in, um, in keeping people back? Like whether it's having those events, um, but not just having the events, understanding our limitations. So then it's about maybe in sense of doing things differently, collaborating with other people in the community where that's their strong point. Like, so, you know, maybe there's someone who is all about arts for children and that's their business, right? So instead of us trying to get a grant to do a, an arts program on our own and we're stretching like the same five people to do all these different programs, we're reaching out into the community and saying, hey, we're looking for people who, this is what you do. And if you could do that in our space, and then bring other people in different ways that that then is a different way of outreaching and welcoming people in. Um, and then also talking to our gardeners. We've had gardeners who once they get stuck in their ways and their space, right, it becomes their bed. And then it becomes their, their we have like, we actually have um, different, each block has a garden for a different purpose. So then it becomes territorial. And even like some gardeners don't have keys to the other garden and things like that. So just explaining and regrouping and saying, hey, it's community in front of garden, right? And always re-emphasizing that aspect and that we, like if we're not growing, we're dying. So that we, so that we change that perspective. It's not people coming in and bothering you because we'll have gardeners who say, oh, but they don't know how to garden. They just come and plant in April and then they're gone, <laughs> you know, and then we have to take care of it. So it's like, okay, well, how do we create a program then that some people come in and plant, other people come in because maybe they have summers off and they help us um, water, other people come in and harvest, a few people go do all of the above, and, and but that we always continually being welcoming. That's really beautiful, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I agree, my hopes for like, um, the gardening and farming future is more spaces for people to grow in because like you were saying like there's some people who like hold on to their to their beds and they feel like other people who are outsiders are coming in and they don't know um, what they're doing but just having more spaces where people can learn on the land and like um, trying to get rid of this um, mindset of like food insecurity and scarcity mindset that happens a lot in the garden spaces. So how can we like channel those resources into our spaces? And like, like you said, um, bring in people who are like, um, they wanna do just art or they just wanna do social media. So just how can we like connect those people and compensate those people too um, and get in those resources because um, it's easy to like volunteer and like do this work, but this work is really hard, you know. Um, you do this work 
you you do eight hours in the field and you feel exhausted after and you just go home and you just want to go to sleep so it's kind of like dividing like the work and just also like learning and taking turns and getting people to also just get involved like more outreach and um, just community involvement because these are all community spaces where we should be able to share with others without having to like block anybody out or like a club like you don't you don't go here but kind of just like opening like the space and you know having people be um graceful and open and meeting people where they're at I always say like I like to meet people where they're at because that's what happened to me when I got involved in farming like I when I went to Rocksteady which is a queer owned farm um at the time my um my knowledge of like like the science of farming was really minimal, but I was met where I'm at. And that kind of like brought in confidence in me. So it's just like bringing out confidence in other people that they can also find a place in community garden and in farming. Thank yeah. you. With that, with that, that all, uh, yeah, meet you where you're at. Yeah, like seeing people. Um, what I would like for community garden to garden. <laughs> what do you um, hope to see happen? Like, what are your hopes for the for the for future growing spaces, your growing space, or just like what you'd like to see in the future? All right, hope, hope for the future. Well, yeah. <laughs> I would love to have hope for the future. So that's one. Um, and <laughs> no, but for real, it's uh, okay. Maybe I'll break it down into a couple things. Uh, policy, I'll do policy and people. All right, so for policy, uh, I would love for if, uh, anybody who has any influence in this great state of New York, uh, but there should be like a minimum percentage of every borough that's just reserved for green space that should never be messed with. So, because I know like where I, I know where I'm at, I know all over when I walk around Bushwick, Bed-Stuy, New York, Brownsville, like there's constantly spots that were green or vacant that are now being built on. There is nothing policy-wise that I know of that's protecting what we have right now as far as a percentage. Uh, so that's for one policy. Two policy, uh, shout out to my uh, green thumb workers in the place, but every year I get emails. Uh, I've been going to some of the rallies uh, about like the budget every year you know, like for whatever reason, like parks and education, always the ones where like they look to cut funding from green space and education. I would love, and uh, I was on the board of the Brooklyn Queens Land Trust, shout out to my BQLT people. Uh, and every year, if you know, if you got like a nonprofit, you're always like struggling, begging, looking to get funding, writing out proposals for discretionary funds that then have to get reimbursed. It's a whole process that can be very tiresome and can be too much for some smaller gardens. I would love if there was just a, a steady commitment to funding for community gardens in perpetuity. We don't need to ask every year. We're doing the same thing every year. We're <laughs> growing vegetables last year. I'm gonna do it this year. I'm gonna do it next year. Stop asking me, all right? It's the same thing every year. I recognize your faces, all right? Stop asking us. We need, this, we need the same money or more every year. We don't need to keep reapplying. So that's a big one for me. Stop it. Uh, and then on behalf of the people, uh, the hope of the future is that I hope that we are able to bring more people into the gardens because that is what really makes a garden healthy is the involvement of the people around it. If the community who lives on that block does not feel like they are a part of that garden, then that garden is not healthy. That garden is not doing well. As somebody in on a very diverse block, I know I need to be someone who can talk to my neighbors who are from Mexico and my elders who was from China and everybody from young to old. And I need to figure out what they're into and what's gonna bring them into the garden. And so for me, my hope is to have more, uh, how do you say, just more gardens that reflect the people that live on that street. Um, another thing that I really 
would love to see more of because uh, my family's Caribbean, a lot of my neighbors are Caribbean, and I think just taking the page out of, of our book, we love to have parties. We love a good fact. Like you throw a good party with some good music on, people will come out. I want to see some more just fun and joy in gardens. Yeah, we plant. Yeah, we complain. But like, let's throw some more like good events. Let's throw some bake-offs. I want to, like I grow some big watermelon. I want to compete. You know what I'm saying? Like I want more fun activities throughout our gardens. A pepper contest. Oh, yeah. See? Like, I want more fun and joy back into gardening and more of us talking to each other and organizing some of these events that then become like traditions. Like when you go to a small town or village and like every year they have these traditions, we should have those in our gardens because then you get planning committees, people start talking to each other. And again, it, it creates something that's going to live past us when we leave our gardens then at the, at the gardens will then take up that mantle and have our, whatever, our annual squash growing contest. But things like that, that bring us together and bring us joy. I want to see more of that in our gardens. Yes to all of that. <laughs> I love that. Thanks for these, for your response. All of that was like, appreciate all of you. Um, so we're getting to like our last, my last question. And then we have some, some audience questions over here that I'm excited to ask. Um, but just kind of closing out the, the main questions that we, we've been and what y'all been sharing today um, and, and interested in hearing like, what are some crops that you're exciting to grow this year? Um, and, or like crops that you're curious about, it could be crops that you've grown before, like you were saying, you're growing the same thing <laughs> your last year. Um, but are there any crops that you're either excited to grow are new to you? Um, and why you're excited to grow that crop. All right, I'll start. I'll start, loop back, because when you start talking crops, okay. Um, so um, I would say one, one of the things that I've enjoyed growing is bitter melon. Um, and for various reasons, right? But I do think it's something that culturally ties um, various countries together um, and they don't always even know that the other like actually eats it. So it's, again, it's like eggplant becomes this big conversation, whether you call it karayali, whether you call it bitter melon, um, you know, just it, it, and I like it also for children. So, because when children come to visit, we, we, we try to grow the, the bumpy and the smooth and be, and especially the bumpy, right? Like when you bring that and you're like, well, what do you think this is? And they're like, a cucumber, you know? Or they start a banana, like they're just looking at the shape, right? And then to get them to touch it, right? It, it, in varying degrees. Some are like, no, the other ones are like, yeah, but it's bumpy. And so you can play around with the texture. You can tell them that, you know, whether it's the translation of Chinese or it's English, it is bitter. It was very, specific in what it is it is bitter it is bitter melon you know in its naming and so you can have that conversation um uh, i think the other thing is like yard long beans so i think things that i tend to pick are like are, are usually from an afro asian perspective and also and that that connection is for me is the caribbean um and so yard long beans and especially if it's the burgundy one because uh, uh, the like red and I like burgundy. And so the next thing is, if it's purple, I'm planting it. So I plant purple tomatillos, purple tomatoes, purple string beans. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then I try to plant other colors that will complement it. So I'm very <laughs> visual. Um, and where I put things are just, you know, I'll, I'll see color. And I think about people who may not be interested in gardens or, you know, we have kids that come in and you pick up a strawberry and you're like, here, taste them. They're like, miss, you picked it on the ground. And then, you know, you're like, or lettuce. And you're like, well, where do you think your lettuce comes from? And they're like, in the bag from the store, you know? And so just having that conversation as to being able to touch and feel, um, I think that uh, that's how I, I think of what I like to grow because I think of like kids seeing it and being attracted to the color. And I'm interested, yeah, I'll stop there and I'll come back. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. 
I love that. I love the color inspiration. Um, I have several that I'm excited to grow um, this year. Um, I want to deepen my relationship with uh, stinging nettle. Um, it's a really good medicinal herb that's good for your blood. It's good for like hair growth. It's good for like skin conditions. I love to grow a lot of herbs to make medicine from them because it kind of like expands the plant into the future. So you're like conserving the plant medicine when you make tinctures, you're making salves, or you're like drying them for tea. So excited to like learn more about stinging nettle. Um, I'm also excited to grow peppers. I love growing peppers. Um, at East New York Farms, we're really known for all the peppers that we grow, specifically like the hot ones and the season seasoning ones. Um, I like to make fire cider with the peppers and we do have a hot pepper eating contest at East New York Farms. <laughs> yes, so yes. stay tuned for that. Um, I'm excited to grow this one variety. Um, I went to visit uh, Central America and I was able to bring um, this variety of pepper called Chiltepe, which is like an ancestor pepper. It's like really tiny, but it packs a huge punch and it had so many seeds in it. It's like really giving and abundant. So excited to try to grow it here. Um, I also want to grow a lot of flowers this year um, for the pollinators. Also like, um, was a specific flower? Uh, Sempasuchil, which is marigolds. Um, I like growing flowers to be able to give to my ancestors in gratitude for what they do for me on my journey as a farmer and land steward. So I always want to have like flowers around. So at the end of the day, I can pick them and express my gratitude um, to the land stewards who were here before us and everybody who takes care of the earth. So flowers for gratitude, because that's my attitude this year. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, that's my gratitude. Um, uh, excited to grow uh, definitely flowers. Definitely flowers. I think I'm in my uh, getting into my like older wise farmer phase of my life. And so I like I just sit back a lot like this and just watch. And for me, like flowers are are just beautiful. And I like to think that we're building like one of the best butterfly restaurants in Brooklyn. <laughs> so we like plant uh, a lot of things for butterflies and and little birds and we just like bird watch and it's a whole thing. Uh, you should check it out. Um, but so flowers are big for me and then I take a walk around the neighborhood and ask elders like what they want to eat. And then that's how we start to plan out what we're gonna grow for that season. We have some like staples that we do every year. And then every year we have a uh, space for kids to come in and start to grow. And then we have a space for like just experimentation. So we'll try to see what seeds we've brought back um, that we can try to grow hair. People bring in seeds like we've got soursop and mango and so we're going to like play around with those um we grow a ton of peppers because one of the elders like all she ate was peppers and collard greens so we grow peppers every year for her um yeah and then like you said like like we love to grow things that are like that start conversations uh so things that look really cool for kids that bring them in uh, things that are like either big or feel weird or just have like a nice text, like a nice like, uh, tactile feel. Uh, we love growing things like that. I love growing watermelon um, because of the history behind it, the stigma behind it. Um, and there is something very spiritual about like, I've had several older black folks from the South like stop in their tracks and just look and I can tell like it's bringing them to like family and so that's something for me like fruits that bring people places like I've uh just this last year like this woman sat down with I gave her we also grow cantaloupe and I just gave her a cantaloupe and she was like oh like I haven't had a cantaloupe since my grandmother and so sometimes we forget how much these pieces of food or fruit like mean to people and to like the love in their life and to their memory. So yeah, so I'm excited to grow things that bring people to places or bring out emotions in them. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. 
Hallelujah. Uh, of course. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, sorrel. <laughs> I'm trying to do sorrel this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think in our garden with the callaloo, I don't think of it as growing it because it has made its imprint mm -hmm. and it is there to stay. But this year I did, um, I ordered, uh, it was um, a pink, a pink amaranth mm -hmm. variety. And so the stem is actually like this bright pink. You know, I like colors, right? Yeah. So, so I'm excited to grow it to see if I can get the community to accept it. Like we're, we're going to do a little taste tester and see. And then like last year we grew the Chinese calla which has like, you know, the people have the lighter green leaves and the red. And so we like to kind of see how it comes, how it compares to what people are used to. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. Kalaloo is definitely a staple <laughs> at East New York Farms as well. So we will be growing that too. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for sharing some of the plants. I'm excited about, I want to visit all. I visited the, these places. I've never been to your garden. So I'm going to be on the lookout. Um, thanks, y'all. I just want to give a little appreciation for our panelists. Um, we're going to go into questions. We have a lot of questions. It's very hard choice. I think we have time for maybe, maybe two or three, depending on, um, these are all really good. So it's really hard <laughs> to choose. Um, there's, there's like some farming agricultural tip kind of questions. Um, but I think this is a good, this, this one is a good one as well, um, about, cause you all kind of talked about a lot of the work that goes into what you're doing. And this question is asking, how do you personally avoid burnout? <laughs> Any of you can go. I'm laughing because I'm like, I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> um, but I think like, I would say what I've learned is I have to be really clear about boundaries um, for myself, for others and for myself. So I have to be clear each year about what it is that I, I wanna do both in the garden, but both out, like whether it's for my business or for my family. Um, and then I have to be clear to others about those boundaries so that they're not crossed, right? So in the sense, in the sense that if they're crossed, it's because I've let them be. And then if I'm, if I'm feeling, whether I'm feeling bitter because of it or, or just like there's too much, so I've learned that I've learned to listen to what I tell my clients and less is more. Um, and that and that in itself can be powerful. You know, a lot of times I think we're we're like, we can do so much. Um, and it gets chaotic and it gets watered down sometimes. And so sometimes just doing being small, but being really good at it um is is just so is is just a bigger benefit. So yeah, just keeping trying to remember that. Okay, I'm gonna make this quick because a lot of good questions. Um, boundaries for sure. Um, people will not know your boundaries unless you tell them. Um, and when you're in the garden space, people walk in with a lot of questions, want a lot of help on everything. So just being, communicating very clearly. Uh, for me, another big thing is to travel. Uh, and that can be anywhere. But a lot of us, we get like very into our own world, our own garden, and we never get outside of that. And so every problem feels gigantic because that's all you're looking at. Like I'll travel to other gardens. I'll just go sit down at somebody's garden and watch them work. That's fun. Um, but yeah, but travel, get outside of like your own garden and like, and breathe and, re and remember that it's like, there's a much bigger world out there. And the problems that you have in your garden, don't worry. They will be there when you get back. <laughs> so take your time, enjoy yourself, and know yourself. Know what you can and cannot do. Be very honest with yourself about your own limitations and what makes you feel good or comfortable. You did not come to a garden to work or be stressed out. You came to grow some food and have some joy. And if you are not doing that, then stop what you are doing and figure it out. Thank you. Um, heavy on the boundaries, you know, know, knowing your body's limitation. I like to practice self-care. So self-care for me looks like um, working out, moving my body, um, spending time with my chosen family. Um, I like to make medicine from the food that we grow at the farm. So just like doing things that you enjoy. That's how you like kind of don't go crazy. Um, yeah, move your body, 
drink a lot of water, eat. Because it can be very hard to like be in the field. Sometimes I'll be in the field and I'll have breakfast, but then some something about like being on the field doesn't make me hungry. But even if you don't feel hungry, your body still needs that energy to keep going. So just like reminding yourself to take care of your body. Thank you. Um, there's some some controversial questions. <laughs> Not controversial. <laughs> Um, but I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to select while also listening to y'all as we're like coming close on time. Um, but I I won't get to all of these, but I think this is one that you all kind of maybe touched on. Um, but maybe going a little more in depth, thinking about how the different spaces and people maybe not feeling welcome or open, like how do you facilitate community? Like what are some ways that you're like, okay, how do you get people to come in or I guess like different um like this person is saying, my experience with gardening is each gardener grows individually and not much collaboration. Um, so like, how are you like facilitating community to encourage that? I think for us at East New York Farms, we have a lot of like workshops and programming. We have a youth program. Um, we do different events that bring community together. Um, and that emphasizes like, this is a community space. Everyone is welcome here. Um, yeah, I think just like, having events and like things that people will enjoy doing like arts having like music story circles and things like that that are aligned with like what the farm needs thank you and i think maybe for us is we we have um open growing spaces that are more communal growing spaces uh so i would say specifically where i grow it's called giuseppe's area and it's part of the community garden where there are individual beds um, but there are no beds in that area. And so while we're maybe we're planning what's being seeded and growing, we're also inviting people in to help us. And it's always a story that as that, you know, by the next season, they are even like mid fall, but the fall planting, they can contribute as to ideas as to what they plant, whatever we're co collectively um, nurturing is is harvested for everyone so it's not just ours we do and then even where the uh like say the more traditional community gardeners where the where the beds or the patches are there's always the idea that you're not just gardening so part of our bylaws is you're not just gardening in your in your bed you're also responsible for the outer area or a specific area in the garden that you're helping to maintain so that there's always that it's not just mine there's also what are we doing for others and the other spaces that are for everybody. Yeah, I like that. The, what are we doing? You know, that's the important part. The we, yeah, it's uh, getting people involved, the street involved. Uh, sometimes, in my experience, it involves you leaving the garden. So you have to step sometimes outside of your own gates and walk to your neighbor's house and say, hey, we're over here. I know you see us. I see you. I saw you see me. See you. Hello. I'm Kofi. <laughs> and from there, we, we you know, have a conversation and with a with few neighbors. We've been able to build because even if they're not looking to garden, they might have a backyard or a little, or a little front. And I'll say, oh, like, well, we can do some container planting or, or if you need some soil or compost, look to us as a resource. And so now we have more people on the block who are growing and are in conversation now. And so, you know, kind of a lot of the question for the way I was taught to think about it was how do you make more people feel a sense of ownership? And that is something that we work on. And by through events, inviting people in, making them feel welcome through repetition and over that time that trust builds and like you said and then giving people more communal tasks like we're all taking care of this space together and then so now people are looking out for the entire space and not just what they think they own in that property yeah true true thanks y'all i think we need to wrap um but there some of the panelists will still be floating around because some of these are very specific questions about different um like plants and how they can 
uh, support with different things. So if folks, if y'all are still available, maybe afterwards and you want to come up and ask them um, personally. But I do know we need to wrap. <laughs> I can't see if I were, well, maybe, maybe we can, one do you think we can do one more question? Okay. All right, all right, all right. So maybe we do one more question. Um, speed round. Speed round. Okay, so we'll do a speed round. Okay, any any plants that you would suggest for hair care? For what? Hair care. For hair care. Calavera. That's not. Oh, uh, stinging nettle. No. Stinging nettle. <laughs> stinging nettle and and rosemary. Yeah, rosemary. rosemary? You, can, okay. you can make like a. I don't. A I don't. Know. Tincture. Next. I don't know. Next. <laughs> next question. <laughs> Well, you can skip that. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. next, next question. <laughs> um, what is a plant you'd like to see in every green thumb garden? This is a rapid round. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> More flowers. Yeah. For the pollinators. I'm a yeah. Same. The bees. Figs. Figs. Okay. I'm also with flowers. Flowers. flowers also because they protect other plants and yeah. they bring bees All i right. think more like companion planting like more polycultures things yeah. like that okay we're getting more into the technical thing. Go ahead. <laughs> how do you grow pigeon pea to make it fruit before winter yeah. also also sorrel okay so pigeon peas i've never tried here um, but sorrel, you, I know that you have to, we're still trying to figure it out ourselves, actually, but we've gotten a set of seeds and it's, it's about planting it earlier because it's, it's going to, and, and you pretty much got to bring it in because it's, it's a Christmas plant in the Caribbean, right? And it, that's the drink is made yeah. in December, in November and December. So that's when it's flowers and it's fresh. So it's starting it early. Like if you have a greenhouse starting or inside your home starting it early so that it's it's like ready to go and if you have it in a, so I do it in a pot and if you can bring it in and like overwinter it then you've got the next jump on the next year like we're still trying to figure it out <laughs> I can touch on the pigeon peas um gungo beans um at East New York Farms we actually have a northern adapted pigeon peas that grow well here um, I started in the greenhouse in about May, and it gives fruit until like October. So if you're interested in getting some of those seeds, just let me know. Um, but I would just start it like early in a greenhouse. And I'm not too sure about like the regular variety of it, but we have the Northern Adapted that was um, created for this region. I don't have anything to add, but I will say, one of the reasons that black people love Kool-Aid is because it is red, which is from sorrel and hibiscus. Little fun fact for you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, do you have a problem with gardeners taking other gardeners' produce without permission? Or how do you kind of facilitate the distribution or different things, I guess, is kind of what that question, whoever alluded to that. I'll take that. Also, that fun fact is from the movie High on the Hog. High on the Hog. <laughs> Great movie. Check it out. Now, uh, people taking other people's produce, uh, I feel like that is going to fall into kind of several things that might fall under. How does your garden deal with conflict resolution? Um, and you all need to have a real deep, long convo about how you all deal with con conflict resolution because things will come up constantly we are all human people will overstep people will make mistakes and you need to figure out as a group how you are going to resolve those issues thank you i feel like that's <laughs> any addition um i think that has happened at east near farms people taking produce or like crops from like different beds and stuff i think like more signage like you know if people see a sign that says you know ask first or like just people like to see like visual things I think like you know don't harvest without asking someone first so just like having visual aids and like please don't do that you know it, it, it's better to ask and you shall receive for sure and I can just add quickly is that sometimes if I know who did it <laughs> <laughs> the next season especially if if we've um if I, we've seeded it ourselves I will it's like here have a plant 
Like I will give them a plant of their own or a few and say, hey, why don't you try and see how yours grows? Because it's, you know, it's it's in a slightly different location or getting sun and, and we'll and we'll compare. So and that kind of Thanks, y'all. We are at time. So <laughs> thanks for the rapid round. Give us a round of applause. Thank y'all so much. <laughs>